Okay, how are we doing, everybody? Starting week of March 22nd. Um, getting into mowers here as we start after spring break. Okay. Um, we're going to Get in a couple of things here. Sorry. Okay. All right. Mower safety after spring break. I'll get into starting with the mowers. Um, we got two different types of mowers. <clears throat> Walk behinds, zero turns, to your ride ons. Um, so, I'm going to go through a couple weeks of mowers. Start with zero turns on the 22nd, uh, then we'll do walk behinds uh, the following week. So, two presentations on the mowing aspect, uh, two lectures on the mowing aspect. This, this week's lecture, we'll kind of go through the safety stuff. A lot of the safety stuff is repetitive from a lot of the safety things that we've already been through. Uh, so I will I'll kind of breeze through a little bit of it, <clears throat> stop and um, smell the roses when we need to go over a couple of things. Um, but some, a lot of these are the same types of safety things that we have to do. Um, kind of like it's been said in the past, as we do safety, I mean, that's the idea behind it is to be repetitive, to um, instill it in our minds um, and just keep it fresh. I mean, that's the idea behind safety. Uh, so even though we've heard it, we've seen it, we've experienced it, uh, we're going to keep talking about it because uh, it's important. It's an important part of operating any of the equipment that we've been operating. So then we got a couple weeks of mowers, then we'll get into the handheld stuff, weed eaters, mo uh, blowers, edgers. <clears throat> we'll kind of spend those three weeks kind of putting everything together as far as out on a job site. Um, obviously, what you don't mow, you have to weed eat, uh, those types of things. There's obviously certain things you can't mow, but you have to weed eat anyway, um, just to kind of clean up and do all those things as we, as we, do, in, um, as we do in landscape and in the maintenance um, in general. So that's kind of where we're going for the next couple of weeks. <clears throat> we also talked about our final presentation that we're going to do. So. So after a spring break here, I've incorporated some videos into our presentation. Uh, depending on time, I'll play them here or um, hope that you click them, uh, click the link in the PowerPoints uh, within Moodle. Um, you know, putting them in there for a couple things. Number one, uh, latter half of the semester, a uh, little bit of motivation. Some of these are motivational speeches. Um, and then, you know, dual, uh, dual purpose would be um, the presentation aspect, you know, seeing some presentations, seeing some speakers, seeing how they're organized, seeing how they speak, those types of things to kind of get you in that mindset uh, towards the end of the semester. Okay, so when that's towards the end, when I get to that, we'll kind of hit that again. So as we get started, um, you know, not, not everybody knows how to mo operate the mower safely, right? Um, the stigma about landscaping in general is, is everybody can get on a mower, everybody can go mow somebody's grass. Barriers to entry to this business are very, um, very few and far in between. Uh, but the reality is, is that's not true, right? <clears throat> you know, you guys are going to school for this. Um, you know, so that you will you will receive a degree in it, and you will be far ahead of the guy who just puts a mower on the back of his uh, truck and trailer and starts mowing grass. Right? There's a lot more to it, not just the safety aspect. Um, so when we're practicing and learning as well, it's not just crank that baby up, let's go ride and cut the grass down. So there's a little more to it. Um, and we'll kind of go through that as we go through uh, the process 
of the mowing end, end of it. Okay. Accidents are a little less for mowers than some of the other areas. Number of injuries, even death may occur if uh, safety practices are ignored. Okay. <clears throat> so same thing with any of the other equipment. You know, we have PTOs, um, which engage which engage blades. We have rollover protection devices. We have all these things that um, have been involved on tractors, uh, the skid steer, all that type of thing. So mowers are the same same way. Even though there's a deck that covers the blades, um, you know, you get off that mower, blades are intact. Most of the time, you can't get off with the blades intact. So it'll shut it'll shut it down. There's a safety uh, switch that that'll trigger that. But if you do and you happen to and the, and the mower just spit something out. Um, and you hurt yourself or you get something caught underneath it, whatever the case may be, um, you know, there, there, there's some dangerous aspects to the mowing, okay? <clears throat> so some of the terms, um, the, the PTO, uh, rollover protection system, uh, dead man switch. So touch on, we're, we're familiar with the PTO, uh, we're familiar with the rollover protection, right? Um, PTO usually in the mowers is the blades oriented. That's pretty much the main thing. Okay, you put the PTO on, the blades are going to get engaged. Um, roller protection device is the same thing when you're on the zero turns, when you're on the riding mowers. It, it's, it's the rollover bar that's over the top of you. <clears throat> that way when you belt it in, right, if you're belted in, you're on the mower, it tips, seatbelt holds you in, rollover protection device prevents you from getting crushed. Right, so similar same things that we've talked about before. Dead man switch, um, it, it's kind of what I said, you know, it's a safety switch uh, that if you leave the driver's seat, it's going to shut off that PTO. Okay, most of, uh, most of the mowers are uh, like that as well. Same thing on a walk behind, um, you know, it's um, hand driven. Okay, so you have hand controls. Um, one portion of that hand control will be to engage that PTO. So if you let go of that, then you know the blades will disengage. <clears throat> okay, so rollover protection device, just a little little trivia there, right? Although there were a few accidents with mowers, a number of injuries occur when the mowers are in use. Uh, the accidents are caused by driving too fast, operating unsafely on uneven ground operating a mower that has been mechanically, that has not been mechanically maintained and pushing the mower beyond the safety operating limits. <clears throat> right, so that's with any, any piece of equipment that we've used, you know, whether that's on the side of a slope, going uphill, going downhill, whatever that case may be, right? Don't, don't put that machine, that piece of equipment in a place that it doesn't need to be. Don't drive so fast with it. Um, all, those, all those types of things are gonna help prevent. So pre-operation procedures, problems can be identified before stepping into the driver's seat, needless accidents can be preventative. Okay, so what are some of those pre-operation procedures, right? Guidelines for getting familiar with your equipment, using a safety checklist, having your personal protective equipment on, okay? So because that goes into reading the owner's manual, um, you know, make sure you've done some training on these types of, th this particular piece of equipment, um, having your PPE on, all those types of things before you get on. Is there any visual, visible evidence of that mower not operating properly? Whatever the case may be that, um, that, that you can do before you even get in it and turn the key, right? So like I say, reading the owner's manual, uh, any sort of adjustments that need to be made, whether that's to the deck, to the seat, whatever the case may be, um, you know, Training, observe a skilled operator first, make sure you're comfortable with it, um, and, and, and do your practice, right? You know, be familiar with it. <clears throat> okay, another little trivia too. Um, overturns have the highest fatality rate for unintentional injuries involving tractors that occur on the farm. According to the reports from 31 states, covering about 66% of farm tractors in the United States. In 1995, overturns counted for 55% of all the farm fatalities reported, right? So they're, 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 we're, we're lumping um, tractors and mowers kind of in that same category, same type of thing with that rollover protection device, right? When you're in that seat, 
roll of a protection device devices uh, up, you know, you have to have your seatbelt on. Okay. If, more, if the roll of a protection device is down, um, you unbuckle your seatbelt. That way, if something happens, you are able to get out of that piece of equipment. Okay. Safety checklist. Make sure all your protective guards are in place, right? So you have guards. Um, you know, the, the, the blades are covered under a deck. Uh, there's usually a, a guard chute that, that'll throw the grass out right. Um, all those types of things. There's some guards that cover the belts that are on top of the deck. Make sure all those things are there. Determine the steering is responsive before beginning, right? So if you get on, whether you're loading that machine up on the trailer, moving it around the, the yard, whatever it is, make sure it stops, make sure it's, make sure it's performing the way that it should be performing. Just as you drive it around the yard, load it up on your truck. Um, even when you get to a job site, load, you know, unloading it, um, driving it to wherever you're going to start mowing. Make sure everything's working right. If everything's not working right, then let's let's park that machine. Let's figure that out what what, what it is. Let's not jump on it um, and, and cause an accident unnecessarily. <clears throat> Make sure your bolts are tight. Okay. Um, you know, all, all these all these types of things. Um, if you're operating the truck in the trailer, you know, make sure you have your flashing warning signs on when you're when you're traveling down the roadways, when you pull into drives, whatever the case is. <clears throat> if you have a, um, you know, they talk about slow moving vehicle signs here, um, whether you see the mowing signs usually on the side of the road, just to warn somebody to, to be on the lookout for what you're what you're doing and where you're at, that type of thing. Don't remove the guards, um, you know, the flashing lights, these the, the, don't, don't take away the safety things that are put in place to keep you from getting injured. Okay. Employers reported 6.2 million non-fatal injuries and illnesses among mowers um, in 1996 and 5.8 million of those cases resulted in either lost work or time, medical treatment, job transfer, um, according to the Bureau of Labor. Okay, so that's a lot of a lot of injuries. Um, out of those 6.2 million, 5.8 million were um, resulted in a, a cost, basically, right? Um, so there's that's a big percentage of what um, the accidents are that, that are related to some to some sort of cost. Okay, so. You know, they're serious, they're plentiful, they happen all the time. We just need to do our due diligence um, and try to avoid those. That being said, you know, that's why we keep talking about the safety aspect too, right? That's why we're, you know, 10 weeks into it, <clears throat> we talk about the same types of things because it's, it's important in the way that you learn it, um, the way that you um, implement it out on the job is to, I want to say drill it in your brain, but at the end of the day, you know, you understanding that, 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 that safety aspect. Okay. You're going to be able to know that there's consequences when you're not being safe, whether you are just the, just the operator yourself, whether you're the manager, whether you're the owner, all those types of things. Right. So the more that you know about it, the more you see it, the more you hear it, the more you experience it, <clears throat> more real it gets. So, you know, that's why we that's why we keep continually talking about it and hopefully outside of this class you continually um, see that and, and, and implement the, the safety aspects as well personal protective equipment right so you got hearing protection um, when, you, when you're operating these machines they're noisy engines are loud um, gloves they're, they're not always going to prevent an amputation but they can guard against cuts and abrasions okay um, long pants should be worn. Um, that way you don't hit, get any, um, anything flying, anything that's, that, that's around, something, you know, swing, uh, slings out and hit you on the leg, whatever the case is, you know, the pants, long pants can help you protect your, your skin in that aspect. Um, so some dust masks, sometimes you'll see dust masks. <clears throat> um, workers using the dust mask to kind of keep the chemicals out. Um, you know, a good type of thing, you know, once it gets hot and dry here in North Carolina in the summertime, um, you know, you, and you're still mowing grass, it gets very dusty. Um, 
you know, helps you keep that out of your nose, out of your lungs, out of all, all that type of stuff. So it does massive important. Pollen season coming up here around the corner. Um, you know, a lot of guys that, um, that, that do a lot of mowing in this time of year too. Um, you know, that pollen, when you're, when you're mowing that pollen and kicking it up even more and more, um, you know, it's nice to have a dust mask so you're not breathing that in as much as you, trying to help you not breathe that in as much as you can. And then having your safety glasses on. Remember to wear the right type of job, uh, right type of personal protective equipment, right? So, you know, if it's tight clothing, um, so it's not loose, gets caught up in things. Um, you know, we talked about that for the chipper, having the right gloves, so something doesn't get caught, pull your arm in, all those types of things. So personal protective equipment, we talk about but having the right equipment, making sure that you have it on properly, uh, supported portion of that. Wear your personal protective equipment for your ears, eyes, hands, nose, legs, and feet. Okay. Keep your keep your PPE clean, sanitary, in good working order. Um, and, and take them take them out of take them out of use when something's been broken. Right. Most mower accidents occur between April and October, with June doing the peak accident month. Um, this is you know, no science space behind this comment, but at the end of the day, that's obviously when we do a lot of mowing, not just here in North Carolina, but throughout the Southeast, Northeast, right? There's a lot of mowing going on in those, um, in between that time frame. So it's probably why there's as much accidents that occur during that time frame. So your operating procedures, three kinds of procedures for safety, safely operating mowing. Your general safety procedures, operating on uneven ground and avoiding thrown objects hazards, right? So these are our three, three main topics here uh, as we'll go through each one of those. So general safety guidelines, um, they may sound like common sense, but they're often abused by operators, right? So you always, it kind of goes back to the beginning. Everybody thinks that they can operate a piece of equipment, especially a walk behind mower, a push mower, something that you just get on and steer, right? It's, oh, it's easy, oh, it's no big deal. Um, you know, that's what happens, right? Makes, makes uh, you, you put your guard down when you, when you have that mentality, okay? <clears throat> Mowers, only one operator allowed, okay? No passengers, um, no kids, um, just a, it's a one, one seat, uh, just like we talked about with the tractor. Uh, there's not a two-seater, uh, it's designed that way for a reason, okay? So when you leave the seat, disengage the PTO, engage the brake, stop the engine, wait for everything to stop before you dismount, okay? Kind of, kind of the same thing that we've talked about when we have all the other equipment that we've, that we've gone through. Um, shut it down, make sure it's off before you get out of it. Um, it just, it's, it's good practice. It's not gonna save you any time to leave it running then to get back on it and turn the key, right? It's just not saving you that much time in order to do that. <clears throat> but it can definitely save you um, an injury by, by doing that. So just keep that in mind. Operators should not adjust any mecha mechanism of the equipment while the mower is running, but should follow the um, procedures for making sure that everything is stopped, right? So don't adjust the, um, don't adjust the speeds, um, don't adjust the, the, you know, these things have or motors on the wheels uh, that turn the hydraulics, uh, that turn the wheels, those types of things. Don't adjust those. Don't loosen them. Uh, don't try to make that machine any faster than it is. Um, those types of things. Okay. When you're driving between uh, jobs and crossing the road, the sidewalk, um, and you're not using the mower, the operator should disengage the PTO, right? So if you're going across the street to mow Miss Susie's house, and you've already mowed this house, don't, don't run the, don't have the PTO on. Turn it off, go across the street, get to where you're going to mow, turn it back on, right? <clears throat> and then watch where you're, watch your traction, right? So if it's uncertain, um, you know, do, do a test drive without the PTO on, okay? See if you can get in there without the PTO. Um, turn your machine off, get off, walk through that area um, is always a good, is, is a good rule of thumb. Those types of things. 
Don't refuel the equipment when it's running or extremely hot, right? Same, same type of thing that we've talked about before. Okay, just engaging the PTO and putting the brake on, stopping the engine and waiting for all parts and stop uh, waiting for all parts to stop moving before getting off the mower are good common sense rules to follow. Once again, not always common, um, but can help you uh, avoid that injury as well. And it's not going to save you that much time by not doing it. Okay. Over half of the tractor and mower related deaths results from overturns. Most, uh, most go over sideways, some go over backwards, and chances of survival are better if your tractor or mower is equipped with a rollover protection device and the seatbelt and you have it in, right? And you have that seatbelt on. All right, going into number two, operating on uneven ground. Operating on uneven ground. Uneven ground is the number one cause of accidents due to rolling of the machine, right? Whether you're on a side hill, you're going up a slope, um, or you're just on uneven ground where you're, where you're rocking um, and hitting bumps and going too fast and all those types of things. Um, you know, all that is included in the uneven ground, right? Not all equipment is um, equipped with roller protection device, but mower, operation, mower operators have been killed or severely injured by improper operation on uneven ground, okay? So even when the roller protection device is used, operators remain at risk and therefore should develop and should evaluate its, each situation on the safest way to mow, okay? And if that means getting off of it in that area before you take your piece of the machinery out there, that's what it means. Save you an injury, um, and it can also save you time too, right? So if you think that you just need to go out there and um, hit it hard, start mowing, cutting it, getting on to the next one, well, what happens when you, number one, you break something, number two, you have an injury, number three, you get stuck somewhere, Whatever, right? So that time that you're thinking that you're saving, now, now it's costing you time. So to, to, to evaluate the area before, it's, it's, it can save you time in the long run, okay? Um, if the area is too sloped or deemed too uneven to operate, use a weed eater, right? So that's what we're going to go ahead and talk about um, over the course of the next couple weeks as we mow. Um, we mow with a zero turn. We mow with a walk behind, uh, and we come back with a weed eater, and then we clean it all up with a blower, right? So we're going to talk about that, all that process, uh, what we need to be looking for, all those types of things. So if you're not able to mow it because it's too, too wet, um, ground's too uneven, uh, whatever it is, safety aspect, that's what a weed eater's for, okay? Sometimes you will be required to weed eat a lot of stuff as part of the job, okay? Um, and that's just the way that it is. But um, you you trying to mow an area that you shouldn't is going to lead to um, whether that's injury costs, whether that's m m mower malfunctions, whatever whatever it may be, um, is going to add up to way more than you spending the time or your or the guys working with you spending the time to to weed that area. Okay. Before mowing on uneven ground, prepare the machine. Right. So if you're going to do it, right, there are some, st some steps that you can do to make sure that you're doing all the things that you can to prevent any injuries. So if you have a differential lock, go ahead and lock that in. Um, that way the both back wheels are trying to spin at the same time. It's not just operating one wheel at a time. Okay. Um, if you have weights as well to increase the stability, some mowers do, some mowers don't, you know, put those on as well. Um, when you're on uneven ground too, right? Slow down. Um, going slower is fine. Um, you don't have to go full throttle all the time, especially when you're on uneven ground. That's how turnovers happen. Um, be alert for holes and ditches, all those types of things. Drive up and down the hill. Don't drive on the side of the hill. If you can mow your, if you can mow a hill. Don't grow. Don't don't do it on the side. Number one. It's for the tipping aspect, okay? Number two, um, what you see a lot is if you mow the same, the same hill, <clears throat> your mower is gonna go in the same, the same path, the same width, every time you mow it. And eventually, 
that hill is going to get ruts created in it from your tires as they grip that hill. So you'll have lines of dirt, uh, which are from your wheels, spinning and digging up the, the grass when you do that, right? So you're going up and down that, um, that mower is not digging in, um, trying to hold that hill, right? It's mowing it properly. You're cutting the grass. You're not turning your wheels and digging up that grass. So one thing to think about too, uh, if you haven't seen that, noticed it, um, you know, maybe we'll have an opportunity to kind of explain that or show that a little bit to you as well. Uh, do not stop when you're going up and down the hill. Once you stop, um, you stop that momentum. Um, you know, it can, it can be a bad, bad situation as well. Okay. If you do have to stop, turn the PPO off and back down slowly. Okay. Um, don't try to stabilize it. Don't try to hold it. Um, you know, don't, you're, you know, not saying you're not strong, you can't overpower the mower, um, but at the end of the day, don't, don't try to get in the way of a thousand pound piece of equipment. I mean, you wouldn't do that in the skid steer, right? You're not gonna try to push the skid steer up. Um, so, you know, the mower is the same way. Don't, don't try to manhandle the, the mower. Okay, it, it went in doubt, it, don't, don't mow it, right? Um, like I said before, you, you can get mad or your weed eater guy can get mad because he's got a weed eat it and you know here's a piece of equipment to to operate it um but if you mow it and an injury occurs or you break something um and you damage the mower you didn't save any time right i mean you could already had a weed eat it gone on to the next thing um, and nobody got hurt so just think about the, all these things when you're out on the job site fewest motor mower accidents happen on sunday most people aren't mowing. Um, on the other hand, Saturdays and Wednesdays are the peak days for accidents. Keep in mind that accidents can, can and do occur on any day of the week, usually when they are least expected. Okay, thrown objects is the third one, right? So got a PTO going, blades are spinning, throwing out grass, okay? So what else can happen? You can throw out rocks, you can throw out sticks, you can throw out all kinds of things as it's spitting out um, things from that, um, from that chute, okay? So you need to be aware of that, you know, especially if you're going to run something over, you know, it's going to chop it up and it's going to spit it out. Um, so you need to, you need to be aware of what, what is, what is happening, right? Most newer model mowers um, have an optimal equipment that catches and cuts material. Um, it's less important than it once was for operators to be aware of thrown objects. Um, you know, some mowers have a mulching mechanism in it. Um, I think that's kind of what we're talking about here. So, a lot of it is a mulching mechanism to where it doesn't throw it out, where it will mulch it into the ground. Um, so it still can kick things out, um, but it doesn't, it doesn't have the chute and the discharge. You can also close that chute and that discharge in some mowers, right? You can put a little door down if you would, um, and, it, and it clogs up that chute and it turns it into a mulching instead. Um, and, and, and that's an optional thing too. So check where your grass and weeds are high enough to hide the debris, right? So if the things are, if the grass is high, weeds are high, going into it, you can't see a lot of this stuff, right? Just need to try to inspect those areas, make sure there aren't branches, make sure there aren't rocks, right? A branch might be okay if you run a branch over and you just hit the, 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 the end piece twigs and it chops it up and it spits it out, you know, probably not that big of a deal. We're gonna dull your blades a little bit, but not that big of a deal. You run over a rock and you, and you damage a blade, now you got to stop, you got to change a blade, you got to do all that type of stuff. So, um, you know, when the grass is high, you can't see as well. You need to do a good inspection beforehand, um, you know, getting out, walking it, uh, and, and you can also reduce your speed so you can see those things when you were, when you were mowing, okay? Instead of going full throttle, full bore ahead, slow it down, see, see what you can see in between the, the, the tall grass, okay? Um, obviously, don't hit any people and animals. Um, you know, kind of judge when that stuff is being thrown out. If there's pedestrians walking by, um, I know we've all seen it, and it bothers me because it's so easily fixed. But people do it all the time. Is when you're when somebody's mowing and they're throwing the grass into the road, 
um, throw it on a sidewalk, just turn the mower around and go the other direction, make, make two passes, three passes, throwing it back in away from the road. Um, you know, rocks and twigs and anything kick up and, you know, you hit somebody, you hit an animal, you hit a vehicle, you know, it's just, it's just bad. I mean, there's, there's no reason why you can't mow two, three, four passes and throw objects towards um, an open, the open grass, the open lawn area, um, instead of throwing it on the road. So just keep that in mind, right? Uh, equipment shields must replain, remain in place and not be removed. Um, you know, those are kind of the deflectors that you see. Choose a little black plastic thing. Um, you know, don't, don't remove it. Um, it's for, it's for safety. It's, it, it, it's not just for things to uh, come out of that side shoot of the mower and just be, you know, in this certain spot. You know what I mean? A lot of times people will remove it. You'll see a lot of companies remove it because if they mow in the mornings and the grass has dew on it or it's been irrigated or whatever the case is and that grass is wet, um, it'll clump, right? So you're mowing it, the shoot's clumping it up. Um, so now you're mowing the grass and now you got a bunch of clumps, okay? You take that guard off and it blows that, it blows those grass clippings out a little bit more and it doesn't clump up as much. The mowers not designed to do that something bad can happen. You just need to keep that on, mow it twice, whatever the case is, have a guy come back, blow those clumps out with a blower, not a big deal, okay? Dead man switch is referred to by the mower operator as a device that will automatically power the machinery off, okay? Usually it's when you get up, when the, when the PTO is on and you get up out of the seat. Um, it's a, um, Dead man switch, safety switch, whatever you want to call it. Um, it's kind of what happens, shuts that PTO off. Your engine will still be running. Um, parking, gate, parking brake will not be engaged. All those types of things just shut your PTO off. Okay. Um, this one, this, uh, um, this presentation was put together. Um, I didn't do this one. Um, so we give credit where credit's due, some Oklahoma State. Uh, graduate trainings kind of put this one together. Some good information that I thought was good in here, uh, especially related to the safety aspect. Um, once again, next week we will go to um, more of the operations of the walk behinds and the ride ons. Uh, a couple of videos that will be in those presentations as well. Um, so, safety this week, a little more operation next week. Um, this was kind of what I was talking about earlier motivation, right? So twofold. I'm going to do this through the latter half of the semester. Um, number one, look at different speakers, look at different speeches, look at the styles, um, look at the way they're trying to engage with your, uh, with their, with their audience, all those types of things. Look at them. The other half, you know, some of these are motivational. A lot of them are commencement speeches. Um, so if you guys are graduating this year, you know, kind of get you up, up into that graduating mode. Um, so just some things to kind of keep you going. Um, maybe not listening to me for, for an hour at a time. Um, I think we got time this week to, to listen to this one. This one's um, Admiral, Mc, Admiral McRaven. Um, it's a, a commencement speech. It goes through 10 things. Um, pretty good things just for life in general. Um, so we'll watch this one. What starts here changes the world. I have a few suggestions that may help you on your way to a better world. And while these lessons were learned during my time in the military, I can assure you that it matters not whether you ever served the day in uniform matters not your gender, your ethnic or religious background, your orientation, or your social status. Our struggles in this world are similar, and the lessons to overcome those struggles and to move forward, changing ourselves and changing the world around us will apply to all. Of so here are the 10 lessons I learned from basic SEAL training that hopefully will be of value to you as you move forward in life. Every morning, 
in SEAL training, my instructors, who at the time were all Vietnam veterans, would show up at my barracks room, and the first thing they'd do was inspect my bed. If you did it right, the corners would be square, the covers would be pulled tight, the pillow centered just under the headboard, and the extra blanket folded neatly at the foot of the rack. It was a simple task, mundane and best, but every morning we were required to make our bed to perfection. It seemed a little ridiculous at the time, particularly in light of the fact that we were aspiring to be real warriors, tough, battle-hardened seals. But the wisdom of this simple act has been proven to me many times over. If you make your bed every morning, you will have accomplished the first task of the day. It will give you a small sense of pride, and it will encourage you to do another task, and another, and another. And by the end of the day, that one task completed will occur into the many tasks completed. Making your bed will also reinforce the fact that the little things in life matter. If you can't do the little things right, you'll never be able to do the big things right. And if by chance you have a miserable day, you will come home to a bed that is made. That you made. And a made bed gives you encouragement that tomorrow will be better. So if you want to change the world, start off by making your bed. During SEAL training, the students during training, the students are all broken down into boat crews. Each crew is seven students, three on each side of a small rubber boat, and one constant to help guide the meeting. Every day, your boat crew forms up on the beach and is instructed to get through the surf zone and paddle several miles down the coast. In the winter, the surf off San Diego can get to be eight to ten feet high, and it is exceedingly difficult to paddle through the plunging surf unless everyone digs in. Every paddle must be synchronized to the stroke count of the coxswain. And everyone must exert equal effort, or the boat will turn against the wave and be unceremoniously dumped back on the beach. For the boat to get to its destination, everyone must paddle. You can't change the world alone. You will need some help. And to truly get from your starting point to your destination takes friends, colleagues, the goodwill of strangers, and a strong coxswain to guide you. You want to change the world, find someone to help you pass. Over a few weeks of difficult training, my SEAL class, which started with 150 men, was down to just 42. There were now six boat crews of seven men each. I was in the boat with the tall guys, but the best boat crew we had was made up of the little guys, the Munchkin crew, we call them. No one was over five foot five. The Munchkin boat crew had one American Indian. One African-American, one Polish-American, one Greek-American, one Italian-American, and two tough kids from the Midwest. They out-paddled, out-ran, and out-swam all the other boat crews. The big men in the other boat crews would always make good-natured fun of the tiny little flippers the munchkins put on their tiny little feet prior to every swim. But somehow these little guys from every corner of the nation of the world always had the last laugh. So he faster than everyone in reaching the shore along with all the rest of us. SEAL training was a great equalizer. Nothing mattered but your will to succeed, not your color, not your ethnic background, not your education, not your social status. If you want to change the world, measure a person by the size of their heart, not by the size of their flippers. Several times a week, the instructors would line up the class and do a uniform inspection. It was exceptionally thorough. Your hat had to be perfectly starched, your uniform immaculately complete pressed, your belt buckle shiny and void of any smudges. But seeing that no matter how much effort you put into starching your hat, or pressing your uniform, or polishing your belt buckle, it just wasn't good enough. The instructor would find something wrong. For failing uniform inspection, the student had to run fully clothed into the surf zone, then wet from head to toe, Roll around on the beach until every part of your body was covered with sand. The effect was known as sugar cookie. You stayed in the uniform the rest of the day, cold, wet, and sandy. There are many a student who just couldn't accept the fact that all their efforts were in vain, and no matter how hard they tried to get the uniform right, it went unappreciated. Those students didn't make it through training. Those students didn't understand 
the purpose of the drill. You are never going to succeed. You are never going to have a perfect uniform. The instructors weren't going to allow it. Sometimes, no matter how well you prepare or how well you perform, you still end up as a center coach. It's just the way life is sometimes. If you want to change the world, get over being a sugar cookie. Keep moving forward. Every day during training, you are challenged with multiple visual events, long runs, long swims, obstacle courses, hours of calisthenics, something designed to test your metal. Every event had standards, times you had to meet. If you failed to meet those times, those standards, your name was posted on a list. And at the end of the day, those on the list were invited to a circus. A circus was two hours of additional calisthenics designed to wear you down, to break your spirit, to force you to quit. No one wanted a circus. A circus meant that for that day, you didn't measure up. A circus meant more fatigue, and more fatigue meant that the following day would be more difficult and more circuses were likely. But sometime during SEAL training, everyone, everyone made the circus list. But an interesting, an interesting thing happened to those who were constantly on the list. Over time, those students who did two hours of extra calisthenics get stronger and stronger. The pain of the circuses built inner strength and physical resiliency. Life is filled with circuses. You will fail. You will likely fail often. It will be painful. It will be discouraging. At times, it will test you to your very core. But if you, don't, if you want to change the world, don't be afraid of the circuses. At least twice a week, the trainees were required to run the obstacle course. The obstacle course contained 25 obstacles, including a 10-foot fall, a 30-foot cargo net, a barbed wire crawl, to name a few. But the most challenging obstacle was the slide for life. It had a three-level 30-foot tower at one end and a one-level tower at the other. In between was a 200-foot long rope. You had to climb the three-tiered tower, and once at the top, you grabbed the rope, swung underneath the rope, and pulled yourself hand over hand until you got to the other end. The record for the obstacle course had stood for years when my class began in 1977. The record seemed unbeatable until one day a student decided to go down the slide for life at first. Instead of swinging his body underneath the rope and inching his way down, he bravely mounted the top of the rope and thrust himself forward. It was a dangerous move, seemingly foolish, Fraught with risk. Failure could mean injury and being dropped from the course. Without hesitation, the student slid down the rope perilously fast. Instead of several minutes, it only took him half that time. And by the end of the course, he had broken the record. If you want to change the world, sometimes you have to slide down the obstacle instead of first. During the land warfare phase of training, the students are flown out to San Clemente Island, which lies off the coast of San Diego. The waters off San Clemente are a breeding ground for the great white sharks. The past SEAL training are a series of long swims that must be completed. One is the night swim. Before the swim, the instructors joyfully brief the students on all the species of sharks that inhabit the waters off San Clemente. They assure you, however, that no student has ever been eaten by a shark. At least not to make it remember. But you are also taught that if a shark begins to circle your position, stand your ground. Do not swim away. Do not act afraid. And if the shark, hungry for a midnight snack, darts towards you, then summons up all your strength and punch him in the snout. And you will turn and swim away. There are a lot of sharks in the world. If you hope to complete the swim, we'll have to deal with them. So if you want to change the world, don't back down from the sharks. As Navy SEALs, one of our jobs is to conduct underwater attacks against enemy shipping. We practice this technique extensively during training. The ship attack mission is where a pair of SEAL divers is dropped off outside an enemy harbor and then swims well over two miles underwater, using nothing but a depth gauge and a compass to get to the target. During the entire swim, even well below the surface, there is some light comes through. It is comforting to know that there is open water above you. But as you approach the ship, which is tied to a pier, the light begins to fade. The steel 
structure of the ship blocks the moonlight. It blocks the surrounding street lamps. It blocks all ambient light. To be successful in your mission, you have to swim under the ship and find the keel, the center line, and the deepest part of the ship. This is your objective. But the keel is also the darkest part of the ship, where you cannot see your hand in front of your face, where the noise from the ship's machinery is deafening, and where it gets to be easily disoriented. Every seal knows that under the keel, at that darkest moment of the mission, is a time when you need to be calm, when you must be calm, when you must be composed, when all your tactical skills, your physical power, and your inner strength must be brought to bear. If you want to change the world, you must be your very best in the darkest moment. The ninth week train is referred to as hell week. It is six days of no sleep, constant physical and mental harassment, and one special day in the mud flats. The mud flats are an area between San Diego and Tijuana, but the water runs off and creates the Tijuana sloughs, a swampy patch of terrain with mud and gold. It is on Wednesday of Hell Week that you paddle out of the mud flats and spend the next 15 hours trying to survive this freezing cold, the howling wind and the incessant pressure to quit from the instructors. As the sun began to set that Wednesday evening, my training class, having committed some egregious infraction of the rules, was ordered into the mud. The mud consumed each man until there was nothing visible but our heads. The instructors told us we could leave the mud if only five men would quit. Only five men, just five men, and we could get out of the oppressive cold. Looking around the mud flat, it was apparent the substitutes were about to give up. It was still over eight hours till the sun came up. Eight more hours of bone chilling cold. The chattering teeth and shivering moans of the trainees were so loud, it was hard to hear anything. And then one voice began to echo through the night. One voice raised the song. The song was terribly out of tune, but some were great enthusiasm. One voice became two, and two became three, and before long, everyone in the class was singing. The instructors threatened us with more time in the mud, and we kept up the singing, but the singing persisted, and somehow the mud seemed a little warmer, and the wind a little tamer, and the dawn not so far away. If I have learned anything in my time traveling the world, it is the power of hope, the power of one person, from Washington, a Lincoln, King, Mandela, even a young girl from Pakistan, Malala. One person can change the world by giving people hope. So if you want to change the world, start singing when you're up to your neck and mud. Finally, in SEAL training, there's a bell. A brass bell that hangs in the center of the compound for all the students to see. All you have to do to quit, all you have to do to quit is ring the bell. Ring the bell, and you no longer have to wake up Ring the bell, and you no longer have to do the runs, the obstacle course, the PT, and you no longer have to endure the hardships of training. All you have to do is ring the bell to get out. If you want to change the world, don't ever, ever ring the bell. It will not be easy. Start each day with a task completed. Find someone to help you through life. Respect everyone. Know that life is not fair and that you will fail often. But if you take some risks, step up when the times are the toughest, face down the bullet, lift up the downtrodden, and never, ever give up. If you do these things, the next generation and the generations that follow will live in a world far better than the one we have today. And what started here will indeed have changed the world for the better. Thank you very much. All right, so that's my motivational one there. <clears throat> Good 10 points I think um, everybody can relate to. Um, you know, take the military stuff aside, um, but good 10 points that I think everybody can relate to. Uh, it, it, as far as the uh, speaking aspect, um, one thing that I'll point out in this one 
right? And, that, and when you're doing presentations um, and, and trying to gear you up towards the end of the semester, right? I'll, I'll try to pick out a couple different things from each one um, and, and kind of just talk about that aspect. Um, you know, the one out of this one that, that for, for to me is, right, he, you know, he knows his material, right? I mean, it's, it's his 10 points. It could be the, the SEAL training, it could be the Navy aspect that, that, that has that instilled deeper into, um, deeper into their uh, core uh, units. But, and it, but at the end of the day, it's, you know, he, he knows his material, right? He's, he's an admiral, he has the experience. Um, he knows what he's saying, right? He's, he's confident in what he's saying, he's confident in that message. Um, when, you're, when you're speaking and you're uh, teaching people and you and you're, have people's attention, right? You know, know, know your material, you know? Um, that's, that's kind of the big one on that aspect. So kind of going to our discussion question, gonna go a little bit <clears throat> different towards the latter half of the semester. So I talk about a little bit more of the business aspect um, so the business aspect of things, um, you know, trying to get into um, we're going to start talking about landscape companies, so trying to talk about, you know, the equipment that we've talked about, um, trying to relate that to an everyday life. Okay, so this week's discussion question, I'm going to give you a hundred grand, start your own business, okay, own landscape company whatever it wants to be, okay? Um, tell me what kind of business it's gonna be, if it's gonna be landscaping, if it's gonna be uh, growing, um, tree business, whatever it is, um, nurseries, all that type of stuff. Tell me what type of business that it is, why you're selecting it, and then what are you gonna do with that $100,000? What kind of equipment are you gonna do? And how are you gonna prioritize that $100,000 um, for what it is? It, don't spend a whole week going and shopping prices. Put your best guesstimate. That can kind of be part of the discussion as well on what you think. If you think a skid steer costs $5,000, then put that in. I'm going to buy a skid steer $5,000. Okay? Just to give you a heads up, skid steer doesn't cost $5,000. Okay? But if you think it does, let's put that in. I want to see how the discussions come in, and then that will kind of develop into what else we talk about towards the latter half of the semester. Okay, but you're given 100 grand. Tell me what you, kind of business you're going to start and what are you going to buy with that 100 grand. All right. Hope you guys have a good week and we will see you in lab.